Namaste and greeting. I, Zubia Moin, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav, Evam Niti and Sandhan Sansan, Nai Dili, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talk. Today, we are gathered for a distinguished lecture on the topic, The State of India's Urbanization by Professor Um Prakash Mathur. This deliberation is a part of the State of Cities hashtag City Conversation Series, which is organized by the INPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. As the moderator for the session, we have Dr. Somnadeep Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor, Viswa Bharti, Santi Nichetan, and Visiting Senior Fellow, INPRI Mubel. We welcome you, sir. You. Yeah. We are elated to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Om Prakash Mathur. Professor Om Prakash Mathur is a senior fellow, Global Cities Institute, University of Toronto, Toronto. He has served from 2014 to 2019 as a senior fellow and chair urban studies at the Institute of Social Sciences, New Delhi, and held from 1992 to 2011 the position of IDFC Chair Professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, New Delhi. From 1984 to 1992, O. Prakash Mathur was Director, National Institute of Urban Prof Affairs and a Distinguished Professor from 2011 to 2014. From 1975 to 1984, O. Prakash Mathur was on the technical staff of the UNDP initially heading the decentralization project of the Imperial Government of Iran and later serving as a senior faculty at the United Nations Center for Regional Development, Nagoya, Japan. He has served as member of UNDP's advisory panel or on, on urban management program, a member of the UN Habitat's advisory group of experts on decentralization and a member of the ADP GIZ Advisory Panel of Cities Development Initiative for Asia. He has served as a short-term consultant of the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and UNICEF. He was a member of the former Prime Minister's National Review Committee on Jawaharlal ne Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission, a member of the High-Powered Expert Committee on Urban Infrastructure Investment Requirements, and a member of the advisory panel of McKinsey Global Institute, India. Om Prakash Mathur has written extensively on urbanization, urban governance, and urban finance, and authored several books and a number of public papers published in peer-reviewed journal and books. He holds a master's degree in economics and has attended graduate courses at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard University, Cambridge, USA. We welcome you, sir. We are also joined by esteemed discussants. First, we'd like to welcome Professor Kala Sitharam Sridhar, Professor, Center for Research in Urban Affairs, Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bengaluru. We'd also like to welcome Professor Chetan Vaidya, Independent Urban Advisor, former Senior National Urban Advisor, Sustainable Urban Development, Smart City Project, Kochi, supported by GIZ. We'd also welcome Samir Unhali, Joint Commissioner, Department of Municipal Administration, Government of Maharashtra. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Swamidhi Chattopadhyay to initiate the deliberation and invite our esteemed speaker to proceed further. We look forward to hearing from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Zubia, and a very good evening to all of you uh, from Shanti Niketan. Uh, so on behalf of the Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies at IMPI, I welcome you all to this uh, City Conversation series. Uh, just to give you a brief idea about this uh, series, uh, we started this series in 2019, and uh, the aim was to invite uh, the leading urban experts and practitioners to uh, discuss and deliberate on uh, diverse issues related to urban developments, urban policies, urban policy making, and 
the challenge is the policy implementation. And uh, we are really fortunate to have with us some, uh, some of the renowned urban experts uh, sharing their ideas, which are very useful to better our uh, understanding of the contemporary urban challenges uh, and the possible uh, pathways to overcome them. Uh, today's topic, uh, the state of India's urbanization is, uh, is, is timely and of crucial importance as uh, India's urban challenge, as we know, uh, is all set to uh, magnify manifold. The latest UN forecast is that India's rural population will begin to decline in absolute term, uh, in absolute number around uh, 2027, and we would experience significant urban growth. And uh, cities are considered as the drivers of economic growth. So uh, it, is, it is therefore inevitable that the cities uh, will, uh, will play an enormous role in social transformation and economic mobility. But this could also exacerbate the existing inequities. In fact, uh, India's urbanization story is complex and so are its opportunities and challenges. Uh, first, obviously, there are some serious defi definitional issues uh, uh, however, the key point is not that there is a singular way to measure urbanization, but that the criteria uh, generally uh, which we use uh, could be obscuring the actual reality beneath our eyes. Uh, while there is uh, no absolute number uh, uh, that, can be, that can be attributed to India's current urban areas, but it is evident that India is certainly more urban than uh, what we think. Also, there are differences in in the growth patterns of the large and medium and small urban centers. Uh, as far as the census 2011 estimates are concerned, it, uh, 53 major urban centers uh, with population size of more than a, uh, more than a million uh, that house 42.6% of the urban population. And there is evidence of clustering of economic activity uh, around these large urban centers. Another important aspect is the emergence of census towns. In fact, around uh, uh, Forty-one percent of the total urban population now lived in small towns and census towns. But we know very little about their economic contribution. For example, uh, there is there is no empirical evidence to suggest that a strong process of uh, a process of sectoral diversification or or uh, say growth of modern non-agricultural employment behind this emergence of these towns. Now many of them are outside the hinterland of the large urban centers. Now all this implies that the development initiatives and and the economic opportunities divide, diverge uh, widely between the large and medium and small cities. Also, uh, the, coming to the infrastructure and service related issues, infrastructure and service uh, deficits uh, prevail both in large and small cities in India, but tend to be more pronounced uh, in, in smaller cities and also among the poor localities within the cities. A large share of the population is forced to live without the urban basic services and and is grappling with inadequate uh, public service delivery. And we all know about the McKinsey estimates which suggested capital expenditure requirement to the tune of uh, 1.2 trillion US dollar on basic infrastructure and, and more than half of the increased expenditure required to meet uh, the pre-existing infrastructural backlogs. And Indian cities, as we know, are not empowered both financially and administratively. To, to take on these enormous challenges of delivering public services and planning and managing the process of urbanization. In fact, in fact, the development of the cities is impacted very seriously by this inadequate management capacity and, and uh, uh, so as to say the inertia at the local governance level. So the question is, where do we grow from here? How to better our understanding of the uh, development dynamics of the city at the city level and and strengthen the growth potential of a large number of small and medium towns. Also, how to identify the, the geographical and socioeconomic factors uh, that characterize and determine the growth potential of the Indian cities. How to strengthen the appropriate institutions and practices uh, at, the, at the city level uh, to promote a more sort of balanced urban economic development in the country. Uh, in fact, uh, these are some of the most serious issues and we cannot think of a better panel than this one uh, to discuss some of these pressing questions. We have with us Professor Om Mathur, Professor Chetan Vaidra, Professor Kala S. Sridhar, and also Mr. Samir Unalde. And we are all uh, eager to listen to today's speaker and the discussions to understand uh, some of these complexities of India's urbanization process and experiences. So with these few words, let me once again 
uh, welcome you all to this uh, city conversation series and to today's distinguished lecture on the state of india's urbanization and uh, may i now request professor om mathu to uh, take over this uh, virtual space yes it's over to you professor mathu thank you very much uh, dr chatopadhyay uh, indeed i appreciate your invitation uh, dr ajit kumar had asked me about 2 years ago not about 2 years ago but one and a half years ago if i could come and give a talk at that time and i had declined by saying i'm tied up with many other many other uh, things this time i agreed and i agreed for very special reasons uh, you know if, if you have been watching uh, what is going on in the urban sector over the past 5 6 months not years you would notice that at least four big things have happened and that really provoked me to agree uh, to give this talk the first one was the budget presented on the 1st of february by uh, dr sita raman where in probably the first time or the second time where this government really picked up the issue of urban sector in a very major way in the budget speech she said that between now and the year 2047 india would add roughly about 380 390 million people and between 2011 to 2047 india that urban population would more or less double <clears throat> what she said was that if we have to address this transition to india that urbanization up to the year 47 doubling in doubling the uh, uh, urban population by that year then we need to reimagine our cities we need to reconceptualize our cities uh, we need a paradigm shift in order to be able to make this transition productive and inclusive and then she said a business as usual kind of an approach will not do and finally she said that we will set up a committee of experts to look into india's urban transition between now and 47 and ask this committee to give a comprehensive report incidentally the committee has since been set up the second event was during the discussion on the budget itself this budget that was presented by sita rama on the 1st of february one of the members of parliament her name was vandana chavan she intervened in the budget discussion and said that she welcomed the suggestions made by dr sita raman on the setting up of a committee and then pleaded with her that similar committees ought to be set up at the state levels her argument was that the cities in india are in the icu if not on ventilator she used these very strong words that the setting up of the committee is justified on the ground that indian cities are in the icu if not in ventilator these were the exact words that she used now kala you uh, chetan all of us have are familiar with the urban literature and while we in urban literature we find sometimes these uncomplimentary words um, about cities that cities are ungovernable cities are unequal cities are unjust cities are unlivable unlivable but never before did we come across an expression of the kind that vandana chavan used in that during the discussion on the budget uh, that was the second uh, that was a second provocation for me to so sort of think about it and agree for this um, uh, for this talk the third one not too long ago was an article by amitabh kant ceo of the niti ayog saying that urbanization produces growth but in order to enable urbanization to produce growth we need to change our planning systems we need to bring in a different governance architecture and we need a different fiscal system 
he stopped at that point, but he definitely emphasized these three points. And a few days later, after Ramitabh Kant had written, the chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, Dr. Vivek Dekho, and Amit Kapoor, who is the president of the Institute of Competitiveness, he also wrote an article in the Standard saying that India needs more urbanization, but not in the large cities. We need to move on to small cities and tap their attention. Now, these four events in the past four and a half months made me sit up with, uh, with my papers on urbanization, uh, almost forced me to give a, another look at them with the question, where are we at this point in time? And what would it entail if we were to really respond to the, the, the uh, points made by the finance minister, by the member of parliament, Mandina, and Mr. Amitabh Pan and Dr. Vivek Theodore, what, what would it really involve? And it is this part that I intend to share with uh, uh, all of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, uh, partly uh, uh, re-look re at it, uh, the, the paper that I did on the, on the state of the cities, but giving a hard look and also looking at the notions that we have nurtured over this time as far as our urbanization is concerned. Let me make six points here, and I think that would be, uh, that would take me to uh, 30, my 30 minutes or so. The first is, what is the common narrative that we are familiar with? So what is it that uh, an ordinary person, or not even an ordinary person, but even in the public planning sort of discourses, what is it that uh, the, how is it described, for example? A very common description that we see is that India has a very large urban system. Undoubtedly, we are the second largest urban system in the world. No question about it. Then the discussion really follows that India is having a very rapid urbanization and that it is driven by rural to urban migration. And more lately, the discussion is revolving around census towns also, stating that census towns are also adding to the acceleration in the rate of urbanization that India is witnessing currently. Uh, and along with that, the point is also we find in the literature as well as in these discourses that we often come to think that metros are, are increasing, uh, urban agglomerations are increasing at a faster rate compared to small towns and medium-sized towns. And then it is, it is uh, often uh, complemented with, uh, with, with, the, with some of the numbers that uh, India's cities produce 60%, 65% of the GDP, uh, India has very strong agglomeration economies, and we need to really strengthen them. A variant with that has come into being, uh, and that really came from the former vice chairman of the of the Niti Ayo, when he said, and quite uh, publicly, that the technological development and digitization that our country is now experiencing may thin down agglomeration economies, what he really meant was that India need not necessarily have agglomerated large cities because the, the digitization would make them unnecessary. What, what, is, what, what, uh, what, what is required by agglomeration can easily be transmitted by digital technology, even to small towns and to the medium-sized towns. Uh, and also in this debate was also the point that Dr. Chakrapadya, you made uh, uh, that not very strongly, but you did say that, that uh, it is argued in the, in the government circles that our definition is very demanding. And if only we had definition, which is comparable to the definitions adopted by other countries, India's urbanization would certainly not be 32%, but it would be much more than that. Now, this is a very common kind of a narrative that we hear in public, public discourses, especially in, in our meetings uh, with, uh, with the governments. 
I gave a very close look at, at, at all these statements very, very closely with, uh, with a very limited amount of data that, that we have access to. Unfortunately, after 2011, and of course the technical committee report and predictions and the analysis uh, uh, surveys of 2011-12, uh, uh, we really haven't really, more lately, just about 10 days back, we are seeing the new report on the annual survey of industry. But apart from that, the formal data sets which are comparable over time are extremely limited. But even to sort of give another look at, at what we have, um, puts, uh, gives us a very different kind of an impression about India's urban relation. The first point that, come, that came to my attention is the scale of urban population growth versus the pace of urban population growth. There's a tremendous amount of confusion between the scale of growth and the pace of growth. And the pace of growth uh, measured in terms of the growth rate of the urban share of population is extremely low in India, extremely low in India compared to the average of 244 countries for which we have comparable data, it's extremely, extremely low. It's just 0.5% uh, for, uh, per annum, while in the average being much, much higher compared to this, this average. Right. So our notion that India is urbanizing very rapidly somehow gets con con contradicted by when we start comparing the real growth rate, which is really the, the growth rate of the urban share of, of population uh, using the criterion, we, we are among the very slow growing countries. The second point uh, of confusion arises that we, uh, we, we often take urban population growth as urbanization. And if you distinguish between urban population growth and the growth with the transformatory in nature. Are you, are you on the line? Are you on the line? Yeah, it's okay. Yes. Yeah. No, we can hear you. Yeah. I lost, I lost you. Uh, the moment you begin to look at urbanization as distinguished from urban population growth, you get a very different picture. And let me, let me explain what I mean by it. The, the, the critical part here is that the transformatory components of urbanization are really urban to rural, rural to urban migration and the census tax. This is the transformatory part of urbanization. Rest is simple population growth, which is natural increase, which will, which will take place in any case everywhere either equally or unequally, but that is really the trans not the transformative component. And when you begin to compare the ratios of the rural to urban migration in India and the average for the developing countries, which you will find very interesting comparisons in reports, in the, in the World Bank reports and Commission on Growth and, and, and uh, the Commission on Growth that really came out about seven, eight years ago, you find that India is at India at just about 22, 23 percent uh, from rural to urban migration, while the global average is about 40 percent. So the urbanization in India is not transformatory in, in the sense that rural to urban migration takes place, and therefore India is changed. The second part, which is far more disappointing here, is our treatment and our understanding of census counts, which including myself, we have simply been discussing whether it is a stroll, whether it's very urban development, what kind of growth is taking place through census towns. But this is the only component of urbanization where settlements have changed their character. They have changed their size, they've grown in density, they've changed, transformed from a rural settlement 
to an urban settlement by having 75% of male workforce in non-agricultural occupations without any incentive of any kind. And therefore to treat them the way we have treated them over the past 10 years is very, very disappointing. And it is particularly disappointing on, for once again, for two reasons, that the reluctance on the part of states to give them the urban status. One, and secondly, on the same hand, central government giving subsidies to these places, which in fact is keeping them rural and not incentivizing them to come to a scale where country could really exploit their, the economies of such places, which have grown on their own, which have become urban on their own without any incentive, without any push from, push from any quarter. Now, this comes to me as a, you know, and you know, the, the, the old urbanization, which were jurisdictionally bound, is now becoming jurisdictionally very, very open. And if you really look at the figures, um, particularly with respect to the size classes of rural settlements, the rural settlements in the size category of 10,000 plus, and also the rural category, the rural settlements in the size category of 5,000 to 10,000 population, you will find that there are roughly about 20,000 such settlements in the queue to become urban in the shortest possible time. And to me, it seems that that could be the new normal in the years to come. And the moment, the, the earlier we sort of change our perceptions about these places and not subsidize them so that they stay rural, which would be terribly injurious to economic truth of the country, I think that would be, that would be so much better. So my position on the sense sounds is very clear. It's going to be a new normal. And the earlier we begin to change our, our impressions about them, that what are they and we need, we need to give subsidies in order to keep them rural, that would be extremely adverse to the economic growth of the country. This point number two. Let me come to the urban GDP ratio where, you know, it's still the common narrative being that 60% comes out of that, that place and it might go up to 65 very, very shortly. The interesting part is that if we look at the formal data, which came out in 2011-12, only about 53.2% of the GDP is really the urban trend, not 60%. Uh, that's the formal, that's the, that's the, the compilation of the CSO. The interesting part is that the rate at which it was growing earlier, that is 2004, to 2011, and earlier from 2009, 1999 to 2004, the rate at which the urban share was increasing earlier, that rate of increase is beginning to decline. And what is worrisome is that at such a low level of urbanization, if the urban share of GDP begins to decline, the rate of increase begins to decline, that then it is something to be, to be worried about. What is equally to be worried about at this factor is that manufacturing, which is a pronounced urban sector, urban activity, today, 51% of manufacturing GDP comes out from the rural areas and only 49% comes from the rural areas, from the urban areas. Which is once again, while it's true that globally, the share of Manufacturing is beginning to decline globally, that is a global trend. But a decline in our country, which is so, which is which is just about 32, 33% urban, it does raise a very uh, a very worrisome it sort of raise a question as to what could really explain a decline in the rate at which urban GDP is growing. Also, in terms of the productivity, uh, uh, you know, if you add one. 1% of urbanized, 1% of urbanization you add, and it produces in India about 1.7, 1.8% of GDP, the GDP. But in globally, 1% increase in urbanization will, will add roughly about 
3.8 percent of the of the GDP. Now this is this is the this, this is the, these are very some uh, particularly uh, the relationship between urbanization and GDP, which are understanding was that as India sort of opens up, as India moves into a more globalized export uh, oriented economy, these uh, the shares will will rise far more uh, uh, faster than what these have really uh, been the case. Similarly, when you see workforce composition, we are seeing that informalization is growing. Growing even in the formal sector, the unorganized component of the formal sector is growing faster compared to the organized sector within the formal within the formal component. So you are you're seeing these very strange signs, and one begins to wonder whether it is somewhere it is an accounting problem or whether these changes really reflect what actually is happening in the Indian economy and raising very, very vital concerns, uh, both for uh, the economy as a whole, as well as for researchers. We, we can't find, you know, easily explanation as to why, why these things, uh, why these strange kind of changes are taking place. Uh, let me make three, uh, three additional points here. Uh, since uh, you know, Mr. Amitabh Kant and as well as in the, the finance minister, they all raised the governance issues. We looked at the governance issue very, very closely. In fact, it has gotten far more moderate um, after the 74th constitutional amendment than it was uh, before the constitutional amendment. But we will, will not enter into why, why that is taking place. While the, the amendment was supposed to bring in a more single command kind of a governance in, in, in our urban settlements, they, uh, that is what was intended in the 74th constitutional amendment. But the same uh, fragmentation, uh, multiplication of, of authorities that, that process it continues. But much more, much more important from the future of urbanization point of view is that you pick up, you, you take these 45 metropolitan areas of 45 largest urban agglomerations. Now these 45 urban agglomerations have roughly 1200 settlements of which a few are villages, a few are census towns, a few are um, uh, small towns, a few are municipalities, and few are catchment cities. And these UAs are extremely complex. Now, while it is very easy to, to accept what, what Mr. Amitabh Khan says that we need to change our, our, the, the governance architecture, sure. But if a UA has 100 different units, all governed independently. They're all governed by the same laws. All have their own, either a small council or, 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 or a notified area committee or, or a panchayat, what have you. What kind of an innovation should be brought in is such a complex issue that you can't really find an easy solution. So simply saying that we need a proper governance architecture is easier said then to say, and I'm glad you use the word that the, uh, the urbanization is complex, the complexity comes here much more than in any other, any other component of the, of the urbanization process. Let's take the fiscal architecture. And uh, that is one area that I look at very, very closely every time the Finance Commission gives its report and every time the studies are conducted for the Finance Commission. We have been looking at, likewise, Kala has been looking at, Jacob has been looking at, we all have been looking at these numbers very closely. Interestingly, the own share or own revenues share have consistently declined. And what is risen is really a transfers. And, you know, I, I do not know if, uh, if our audience, whether Kala or, or, or Chetan or our Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Nhane, 
whether they have compared the budgets, let's say, of the late 80s before the 74 constitutional amendment and the, 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 uh, the, uh, the accounts of, of today. In the pre-1992 period, the municipal account was very simple. There were own sources, and there were general purpose grants or specific purpose grants from the states. There were just three columns in which the accounts were really shown. You see the accounts today, apart from the own source revenue component, then you have transfers from the states or the grants from the states. Then you have the grants recommended by the state finance commissions and part of that really flows into the accounts of municipalities. Then you have the finance commission grants for the for urban local bodies. Then you have the centrally sponsored schemes, which are also part of the of the uh, of the budgeting sort of formats. So it's getting to be much more complex. But more important than the complexity that comes from this diversification of source is the fact that, and that really comes, very strangely comes from the 15 Finance Commission, which talks about a new fiscal architecture. And what is the new fiscal architecture is that the local public goods, that is water supply, solid waste, and, water, and, and uh, waste collection, these three have been treated by the 15 Finance Commission as national priorities. So the whole concept of subsidiarity, which is the, which is the basis on which the 74 constitutional amendments were based, treating these services as local public goods or married goods that have been completely shattered by the 15 Finance Commission that these are national priorities and they would be governed by a different stream of restriction, this is stream of condition, which it has laid down for municipalities to follow in these five years. That if municipalities are unable to do this, they will not be entitled to receive this grant, even for water supply, solid waste, and waste collection. So we have got into a very, very complex situation where what was local earlier is now national. And on the other hand, what is, I don't know whether it, if there is anything national that has become local. I don't know that part, but certainly what is local is also becoming national. So any kind of tradition coming from persons like uh, uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan saying that the fiscal autonomy of local government should be, should be maintained instead of economy, they get increasingly deprived of the functions that they've historically been responsible for. And let me make two last points. I could have made this point earlier. Uh, if we look at the, this, once again, in the context of urban uh, urbanization, what we're seeing with the demographic dividend, which has been you know, so strongly uh, being bandied about in the, in, the, in the last few years, that India has a demographic dividend. And we looked at the urban part. And the urban part, interesting part is that's true, there is demographic dividend, but where it is? The backward states, such as Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, UP, Uttarakhand, Rajasthan have got a huge demographic dividend. And the southern states are having the problem of aging. So what is productive? Have that aging now fast, and where GDP daily grows, or there's a backwardness all around, including on the other side. It's a huge demographic dividend. It's a, it's a highly complex and very worrisome trend that if we are not able to create jobs in backward parts where there is demographic dividend and where there is growth coming out, and that part is aging, 
it creates, it, it gives to the country a very wise of future. And we don't know how to deal with it. And we are not raising this issue as much as it deserves to be raised in public policy debates. That what you, you, you are uh, uh, good, uh, you know, or not even, uh, and I'm, I'm talking only of the urban Congo, the urban democracy, where you know, job creation and employment creation are our huge problems. Now, it, you know, all these, the points that, that I raised and thinking about these points uh, brought me to two or three very new, very different kind of questions, not new kind of questions, but different. And that really arose because 2016, 17, the economic survey and Arpin Subramani and the company, they had raised this issue that, you know, our definition is very demanding and we need to change our definition. We're much more urban than, than what the official figure is true. Rather than looking at this way, if you look at the problem the other way, that at 1,940 US dollar per capita income now that India has, whether India is over urbanized at this level of per capita income or under urbanized at this level of per capita income, that would be a much more um, a worthwhile question to examine than looking at uh, whether we, whether if we change our definition to uh, what Venezuela uses or what Mexico uses or what Nigeria uses, whether we are uh, uh, urbanized, uh, you know, along uh, across those those statement those uh, criteria, rather than looking at from that point of view, let's look at at this level of urbanization: are we under urbanized or are we over urbanized? And I'm sure that Kala will put few of her students uh, looking at this question after the seminar. This is one question. The second question that is coming to my mind is that. Sure, India will transit definitely from 32 to 35, 35 to 38. There is nothing to stop India from becoming more uh, nothing to stop the transition will take place. The question that we need to be asking ourselves is that when a country becomes urban, let's say from 30% to 40%, what changes as a result? GDP composition, occupational distribution, what changes when transit from 30 to 40 percent and whether India can begin to anticipate those changes and design our responses to changes that are still to come but preparing India for, for, uh, for, for, for the changes would I think be a good thing to uh, look at both from the research and then and as well as uh, from the policy angle, simply to see, I mean, what, for example, if, if Indonesia has changed that way uh, from 40 to 50 or from 35 to 45, what changed? In what way it changed? What became good and what became worse? <coughs> the third question that came where Kala has done some work, which is on the cost benefit of infrastructure, cost cost uh, functions. She has, she has developed those, those costs of infrastructure by city size, which is, I think is a very good exercise. The question is whether the cost differentials of providing infrastructure between different sizes of cities are high enough for us to give in, for us to give preference to this size or that size, whether it influences, whether differentiates are such that uh, our policy preference goes from this size to another size as a result of the cost of it. I think if, if such exercises can be taken up in our country, it would definitely help in designing uh, our urban policy. And the fourth issue, uh, which uh, I thought we should be looking much more seriously. Uh, some of our colleagues, not here, but North Carolina and other places, that we think we get it. 
saying that the private costs of providing public infrastructure, such as water supply, such as electricity, such as waste, safety, private costs are increasing at an exponential rate. And by private costs, they really mean that in case you want water uh, to be available to you all the 24 hours, then you need a sum, you need a booster, you need an over a tank, you need a generator or an inverter to make sure that, or electricity and so on and so forth, to make sure that you continue to get your electricity and water all the 24 hours. Now, these private costs are increasing at a very, very rapid rate. Uh, no, I mean, we don't know whether the charges that all of us pay for water or electricity, what would be the percentage of the cost that I am incurring every month for making sure that I get water or electricity before I stay? No one really knows. We keep saying that we are now, now we are getting water 24 hours a day, but what is my contribution, my cost to it? Public safety, which is a principal function as an obligatory public function. Everyone is now taking guards. Somewhere or other, you have a guard or you are putting those, those, uh, those barriers so that nobody comes in, 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 the, in the middle of the night. So we are all incurring these costs without, without even knowing that these are public services and they need to be provided by public uh, agencies that are responsible for it. Now, these were some of the points that, uh, that uh, I thought I will put on the table. Uh, we have a um, uh, uh, very uh, distinguished panel, my former colleagues, Kala and Chetan, my former longtime friends, and of course, Mr. Unhale is here, uh, who will uh, give his uh, opinion from the state government point of view. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mathu, for your uh, insightful, all these insights. And uh, also, we uh, get to uh, know some of the uh, uh, so newer approaches to, uh, for example, uh, this idea of uh, rather than looking at the urban definitional issues. Uh, the way you have suggested to look at the urbanization of, uh, uh, of whether India is over urbanized or under urbanized with respect to the current level of per capita income and some of the issues of, uh, of these uh, uh, optimum city sizes and all these things are really very insightful. And also, as a, uh, as a student of these urban studies, I also get some very personally, I also get some very useful insights to do some more research on these issues. So thank you so much uh, for sharing all these views and all these insights with us. And without any further uh, delay, let me now uh, invite our uh, 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 the esteemed panelist, Professor Chetan Baidya. Uh, if you sir, please. Uh, yes, sir. yes, it's about you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Samindeep, for this opportunity. <clears throat> I think it's a great privilege for me to be a discussion for Professor Omatu's presentation uh, on the on and also his new ideas. I mean, he is has new ideas every six to eight months, uh, and it's always very well good to listen to him again and again. As you all know, he's my urban guru of all of many of, of most of us, and he's also has been my colleague at NIUA and on other responsibilities. So, uh, thank you so much, Impri and everybody else. And then we have to distinguish panelists here, including Kala and Swamidev yourself. So it's great to be here today. Uh, I think it's very difficult to be to bring out issues. But I think the first thing he brought out about definition, I was just wondering if it's time for us to change definition of urban. And that is something and he has rightly pointed out that rather than changing definition, can we look at how it happens if we link it up with GDP. And I think that would be a very good start to look at and a lot of analysis required. Uh, urban is a challenge as well as an opportunity. The prime minister has just said it yesterday, in a day before in Bangalore. It's a challenge and it's an opportunity. I think we need to look at it. But one thing which is coming out, you mentioned about rural urban migration, but I think there's an also, also an issue of urban to urban migration. I think that is something which we have not studied at all. That is something which needs to be looked at in much more detail and 
kala <laughs> another answer the another talking for your researchers is what happens from urban to urban are they going from small town to medium towns to large town or is a movement directly or it is linked to cultural linkages previously we used to say that the cultural ring, uh, linkage is bringing urban to urban is it still true or what is the diversified effects and as we all know urban india is very large and very diversified so one size fit all will not work so what oh, the whole it is tamil nadu kerala maharashtra will be in a different group then bihar rajasthan uh, and other places but i i still uh, oh my i i'm not it's not that you have to respond now but it's something we need to look at very closely is up which is what is happening to up in case of urban we get all this kind of news that urbanization uh, efforts are being very positive in up is it really true is it it's definitely not generating enough jobs but they have now uh, improved security i mean and how it does it affect urban uh, 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 talking to common man uh, so called migrants or guest workers they say things have improved in up or in last 7 to 8 years but is it true and how it affects up i mean that is something which we need to look at more closely uh, you mentioned about this gdp and i think that figure of 52% to gdp and declining role of manufacturing you brought out that was very surprising to most of us and dinesh mehta has also mentioned it in something else i mean we were told it is 65 and it may touch 70 we are making that kind of thing you you have brought us back reverse reverse develop reverse growth but i think we still look at in some other presentation you mentioned about this gig work economy you know? the people who actually don't work for any company in our, particularly in the service sector i think service sector also produces good jobs and it has impact on other services i believe that one good organized sector service job will lead to four to five services of other kind and then you get this gig economy kind of thing the zomatos and uber and all these people so what is that is something which is coming up with and all these leaders to a very basic question our focus of all our mission is on developing housing and infrastructure is it something we need to review do we need to now focus on education health and all this i think one thing on which we all missed out is community based groups i think you have been involved with urban uh, ucd projects for more than decades now and we have example from kerala and also recently from uh, telangana that they are using community group self help group women self help group or self help group as a in, uh, for in poverty but is it something which we have missed out at the national level is something which concerns me you have rightly brought out empowering local bodies but there is a feeling now and many people are mentioning it the trust of the state officials is less and less on the municipal officials or the municipal leadership and that is a concern that just you also brought out that whole thing even within an agglomeration there are different kinds of urban local bodies and if is one has to empower them it will be a different kind of architecture but we don't know what kind of architecture and unfortunately and unfortunately two things which happened in recent past one is this setting up the special purpose vehicles for implementing smart cities which have taken again in a reverse order rather than empowering uh, our municipal corporations and urban local bodies we have developed another parallel thing called special purpose vehicle and i honestly personally i still believe that though it gave good access to ministry uh, uh, of housing and uh, urban affairs to directly deal with cities but it also reduce uh, the 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 long term impact of improving urban local borders that is and people are gapling some rajasthan people same fellow is in spv and same fellow is in urban local body uh, so that is also something which is happening in baroda i see Uh, that is one and secondly how does gst introduction has impacted urban local but these are the kind of things uh, i think we are in icu but we don't know what will do when you are in icu at least doctor knows what to do you know there are four five things standard sops 
which I because I am told that ICU is now handled. There's so much of requirement of ICU. They're handled by para paramedical and not by senior medical office. Though we think that when you somebody gets into ICU, you will be treated. But I am told that these are paramedical who treat you in ICUs. But there is a standard operating procedure which they have developed and it seems to be quite robust. I'm mean, told. So these are some of the things uh, whom they are. My comments and suggestions are very difficult to comment on your presentation. So thank you very much, Swadeep, for this opportunity and Arjun for this opportunity. And I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you so much. Swadeep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vaidya, for uh, raising these important points. I think it will enrich our discussions, uh, no doubt. So again, uh, thank you once again for making all those points. And now let me uh, uh, request uh, our other panelists, uh, Professor Kala, uh, to please, if you share your views or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Somidip Chattopadhyay, and thank you very much, uh, Impri and Dr. Arjun Kumar, for uh, inviting me to be a panelist of this distinguished lecture by Professor Opi Mathur, with whom I have worked for nearly more than uh, a decade now, 15, uh, 20 years now. And uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to Professor Mathur. And each time, as Chetan rightly pointed out, I learn something new. And it's always a fresh uh, view of urbanization. And it, uh, his his thoughts are always so very clear. So I really enjoyed your presentation, Professor Mathur. And, uh, uh, and I did request Impri and Dr. Arjun Kumar for uh, any monograph or any writing that underlies this presentation. And so uh, they, they did share it with me and I kind of quickly skimmed through it. I mean, it's really a very, very comprehensive monograph, which I compliment Professor Mathur and his team on. And uh, which carefully examines various aspects of India's uh, urbanization. And I would like to heartily congratulate Professor Mathur and his team for uh, this work. And a couple of really high fives uh, for Professor Mathur uh, before I get to my comments. I really like the idea of uh, uh, public services being redefined as infrastructure. And just now, I al also heard him from the 15th Finance Commission, which uh, defines all the waste and uh, water supply as uh, national priorities, right? Redefined fiscal infrastructure. I really, really appreciate that and greatly uh, like that idea. And uh, I think that there are some very, very important uh, policy messages from the research uh, that uh, he and his team have painfully put together. The most important uh, of uh, this being that there is a very high demographic dividend in low urbanized states like Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh. And uh, however, uh, aging in high urbanized states which might undermine the ability of cities to become engines of economic growth uh, there, right? So I think this is really an excellent uh, uh, research and um, uh, this descriptive data that uh, Professor Mathur and his team have put together, uh, I think is very, very useful for students and researchers who want to probe these linkages further between urbanization, the economy, the environment, demographic structure, and a lot of other parameters. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to go through this and also discuss this work. And um, I just wanted to uh, quickly, because we, a lot of this uh, discussion has lingered on the definition of urbanization. I really like Professor Mathur's approach in, in uh, saying in this monograph that, well, uh, this has actually evolved over time. And it is different, right? Different. Uh, I really like it because he doesn't say that it is conservative in the same sense that I have uh, uh, said in the past. So uh, if uh, Dr. Saumidip Chittapadhyay will permit me to share the screen, I hope I can. I will just... Um, you can, yes. Yeah. Uh, so is everybody able to uh, see this? Uh, uh, the can, can, you, can you please make it full screen? Yes. Better? Yeah, yeah, better. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, what uh, the simple point I want to try and make here is that um, there are a lot of countries. I mean, Professor Mathur, I think he was eminently right. I mean, in his uh, monograph, he just uh, looked at BRICS countries, right? 
Brazil, Russia, India, China, and their definitions. Uh, fine, no problems. So what I did was I just took a broad brush of various countries, right? Uh, the US, uh, Australia, UK, and so some in North America, so some in um, the uh, in Europe, uh, UK, Germany, and some of the countries, and also Asia, right? So we just uh, go by this, and you find that Australia, this uh, as this table shows you, defines urban centers uh, as uh, any areas with 1000 inhabitants or more and uh, the uh, uh, United States again the UK the USA they all basically use a population size as their criterion for urbanization uh, as a the sole criterion I should say right so Germany for example uses density as you can see here as uh, one criterion as the criterion for defining urban areas now, China, we know it's a little bit more complex than that, and it uses density and also the percentage of population connected to municipal infrastructure. Okay, now, now let's come to Africa, then uh, uh, some Asian countries uh, which are closer home, like Japan and Malaysia. Botswana, Botswana, 75% uh, of economic activity is non-agricultural, right, for an area to be classified as urban. So that is where uh, our uh, conservish, uh, conservationism, right? Uh, conservatism in the definition of what is urban enters. Uh, Japan, 60%, 60% uh, non-agricultural employment pursuits, right? And Malaysia, 60% non-agricultural pursuits. Zimbabwe, 50% non-agricultural pursuits, right? So now compare this with India, we use uh, population size, like uh, what UK, USA, and Australia use. We use density also in addition to population size, like what Europe uses. Plus, we use non-agricultural employment, that to 75%, right? Like Asian countries, like Japan, Malaysia, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, and all do. So, I mean, this is really overly conservative, as is probably evident from this. So, what I want to do is just show you one more slide here. This is basically uh, an excerpt from my 2020 paper published in Area Development and Policy. And what you find here is that this green bars here show the census definition and uh, their urbanization, the state's respective urbanization based on the census definition alone. And the dark bar here shows what happens when only population density is considered as a criterion for def uh, like urbanization. Right, see, uh, so with this, no doubt, Delhi is 100% urban, but what I want to point out is that even poorer, low urbanized states like Bihar, Bihar is here, right? And UP is here. They also become more than 80% urban if uh, you were to take population density as a sole criterion for defining urbanization. So what this means and what this says is that, I mean, this basically says that India is much more urban than what we know, correct? Second, as Professor Mathur rightly said, we add one more layer to this worry about the decline in the share of urban areas to the GDP of the country, right? So this just means that uh, all India, actually, I found that based on this, if population density were the sole criterion, 69% of India would have been urban as of census 2011. So 69% of India contributing to something like 52% of GDP is the worrying, uh, worrying picture that we get here. So, so I just add to the uh, worry. I'm sorry, I must have tried to assuage this worry, but somehow I've added to this worry now. So this just means that all these states like Bihar, uh, Uttar Pradesh and all, they, they have actually become urban at very low levels of income, right? Like, uh, like our own uh, countries from Sub-Saharan Africa became long time ago. So that is the kind of uh, uh, thing that I wanted to uh, uh, flag. However, like what Professor Mathur said, what this basically implies is that these folks uh, in, in, in uh, Bihar, UP and all now 
since a significant part of them is urban, they require greater transfers, right? Greater transfers. So because uh, of the uh, uh, like fluctuating uh, own source revenues, like what Professor Mathur said. So that is uh, the first point I wanted to make. I'll just stop my sharing as of now. Uh, now, uh, the second point I wanted to make is that I think uh, Professor Mathur wanted to, I mean, deliberately leave out transport out of this because the Census of India 2011 has an one elaborate uh, uh, data set on transport like uh, by distances and by gender. And uh, this is for the million plus cities of the country only. And uh, uh, basically it does not have information on commute time, but it does have a lot of information about commute distances within cities, uh, the modes of transport that people take to go to work in these uh, cities. And also this is classified by gender. So this is uh, one thing I wanted to point out because uh, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that this could explain part of the puzzle or the worry of the low urban share to the GDP because uh, uh, we are not, our cities are near, really not um, as productive as we expect them to be uh, because of increasing traffic time, reducing productivity, and uh, uh, more importantly, a reduction in the size of their effective labor market. So this, I think, would be the underlying explanation of this puzzle and worry that uh, I think Professor Mathur was trying to uh, rightly convey. Uh, one thing I wanted to flag is that uh, Professor Mathur, actually, there is now increasingly data on the GDP of cities based on nighttime lights put out by this GHSL, the Global Human Settlements Layer, uh, which uh, uh, publishes this for a large number of cities uh, throughout the world. And I think uh, for India, I think uh, there is information on their income per capita income. So there is this data on built area, population, GDP. Uh, so we are able to calculate the per capita income, right? Uh, so, I mean, uh, this is for 2015, uh, still uh, does not cover the post-pandemic uh, period, but, uh, but this is one very, very valuable source because now all urban data is really moving towards spatial sciences, right? Uh, uh, trying to understand all this spatially. So that is one thing that I wanted to actually point out. And now, uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to point out is that one of my students, actually, uh, this uh, I'm very happy that Professor Mathur also talked a lot about slums and the access to public services uh, in his uh, monograph in uh, for these uh, slums, uh, but but there is one disturbing trend here, which is that the. Well, I mean, as the case of Dharavi would rightly uh, point out, uh, Mr. Unhale will be able to testify to this, that there are a large number of engineers, professionals, lawyers, and uh, uh, middle-income uh, people, uh, households who live in Dharavi. So this basically means that slums are not really the pockets of urban poverty, like we would think. So on the other hand, there are a lot of poor people who live outside of these slums, and there are a lot of... Uh, uh, people within the slums who are not basically low income or not the poor essentially. So one of my students is actually looking at this particular problem in Bengaluru and he finds uh, he looked at various aspects of financial, capital, physical and social deprivation and he found he finds, he's finding, he is not yet defended his thesis, but he's finding that there are a lot of pockets of deprivation in Bangalore outside of the slums. Actually we got the reviews of this paper uh, from the journal today. So, so that is one thing that I wanted to highlight, and we should not be really making this mistake uh, uh, from Latin America, I mean, which basically uh, 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 say that all their poor live in their favelas, right? So that is not essentially true for us. And there are just a couple more last points which I wanted to make. And I thought that, yeah, I completely agree with Chetan that each time Professor Mathu talks, I identify some research topic there, right? So one of the things that I identified now, which actually does not find a place in his monograph, is the effect of digitization 
on our cities, right? Uh, now, uh, the effect of digitization has been aggravated by the pandemic and uh, everybody's been working from home and uh, uh, the Zoom and WebEx and all these things have assumed really uh, very, very big proportions uh, to the extent that we did not see or know uh, some uh, two years ago, right? So what is the effect of all this on our cities? I mean, uh, uh, not the size distribution, we have discussed that it would not really change that a lot, but what will happen uh, uh, to housing, the affordability of housing? Housing. One of my other PhD students is actually looking precisely at this. I mean, will housing become cheaper because a lot of these professionals are not required to stay on campus or close to their workplaces anymore, right? But they have they are required. It is like a hybrid work model, right? Like how we are doing twice or thrice a week, you go to office. So what has this made housing more affordable in our cities? That is one thing that I would have liked to see, but I uh, did not see. But and also I would have liked to see a little bit more on top planning regulations, uh, uh, building height restrictions, floor area ratios, zoning restrictions, and uh, so how difficult is it to, to be urban in India, right? That is something that I would have liked, uh, which yeah. I did not, but uh, but uh, Professor Mathur himself has given back a yeah. lot uh, to us uh, in the form of questions beyond his uh, 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 magnificent work, yeah. and I, which I really thorough, thoroughly enjoyed reading. Uh, thanks a lot again to Dr. Chattopadhyay, Dr. Rajukman, and Impri for this opportunity, and wonderful listening to Professor Mathur. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sudhar, for raising so many important points. I think it already it just adds to the uh, what Professor Chetan Baita has uh, mentioned. So uh, uh, just now, may I now request Professor uh, Dr. Sami, uh, Mr. Samir Unhale, if uh, I'm not seeing uh, Mr. Unhale in this panel. So uh, Dr. Arjun mentioned that he's listening from- Facebook. Sir, he's joining. He's joining. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I, yes, I'm connecting with him. Okay. But give me two minutes. Okay, okay, sure. And then we can put us Yeah, sure. So meanwhile, Professor Mathu, there are some more comments uh, and uh, questions in the chat box. So, uh, uh, so uh, should no. I read them for, to you? Uh, just yes. okay. okay, 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 okay. Okay, so there is one uh, question uh, or rather, uh, yeah, it's a uh, uh, observation from question from Anuja Gokhale. It's about uh, the differences between urban management and urban development initiatives. Uh, so uh, there should be two distinct framework of strategies, urban management policies for present cities and metros and urban development initiatives for census towns and peri-urban regions. So uh, these are uh, different tools. So uh, what's your views on this? And there is another uh, question from uh, Bharat. Uh, it's about uh, the regional and urban development authorities and town building departments and their role in addressing the uh, present urbanization situation in India. And also there is another question from Bharat. It is about uh, the National Commission of Urbanization. So uh, do we need a National Commission of Urbanization to develop a strategy for sustainable urban planning? Uh, uh, just I'm seeing one question from Professor Tathagata Chatterjee, but it seems to be incomplete. So uh, I think I'm seeing here in this panel. So if you uh, please, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, directly put your question, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shomodip. I was uh, writing the question, then uh, it got shifted uh, to the panel. And okay. um, again, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you uh, once again for inviting. Um, uh, I, I have uh, two, uh, two or three questions. Um, the one is that uh, Professor Mathur um, um, was talked about uh, uh, industries shifting uh, out of the big cities to, to the uh, uh, rural areas or, out, uh, or outside the city limits. Um, my Prime and uh, Ijaz Khani has also written about that. I mean, uh, the deindustrialization of uh, India's uh, uh, Indian cities. Um, now, the question here is: Is this really deindustrialization of Indian cities, or it is an accounting problem? 
are the industries shifting really to rural areas or are they shifting to census towns or the areas which have not been classified as uh, urban because if an industry shifts to a rural area then obviously you know I mean they would be losing the agglomeration advantage which which is a basis that why an industry but uh, generally always been in urban areas so is there some kind of a definitional issue here this is my uh, first question shall i put the other questions now or shall i wait uh, yes please i think uh, uh, professor mathur will answer all of them okay okay my my second question was actually you know being uh, i uh, very much like the point uh, professor uh, kala uh, sridhar uh, put this issue that is about digitalization uh, is that um, uh, uh, in the post pandemic indian cities has become highly far more digitalized digitalization was going on but i mean pandemic has been the trigger uh, to escalate uh, the process but i mean there are two sides of digitalization i would like uh, you to explore uh, expand on this issue one is that there are work from home uh, what's happening um that is at the higher end of digitalization uh, people are you know, those working in software or many of many even actually even management consultants they are also uh, i was just talking to one of my students uh, he was working in kpmg but i mean he is working from berampur in odisha uh, for a fairly long time uh, so that is one thing second is the rise of the gig economy where you know mean the digital economy is creating a link with the urban informal sector so for a long time we thought about you know mean urban informal sector as a kind of a very neglected um, or i mean uh, a particular set of people who don't have the full urban rights and these things but do you think that the gig economy is changing that and they are also becoming part of of the structure of the formal economy i mean gig economy is creating an opportunity to say ola uber um, or uh, you know, sumato they creating an opportunity for people in the informal sector to be linked up to the formal so okay these are my my okay questions. thank you thank you thank you professor chatterjee and just to add to professor uh, just uh, what i'm seeing from the chat box uh, there are two very interesting question from questions from uh, dr shamula mani uh, first is uh, related to the census town and the question is something like this the census towns need not be given subsidy to stay rural so should we be also increase their educational levels and access to skills and credit so that uh, they can contribute much more significantly to the a gdp so your response on these particular uh, uh, aspects and also another uh, question uh, which is put forward by uh, dr shamula mani this this is about uh, the uh, the question related to the pollution the how do we address this issue of pollution because it's clearly affecting the health longevity and productivity and and uh, there are some other questions related to climate change and so yes. they yes sir yeah it's fine okay so 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 these are some of the questions uh, uh and so uh, so i think i'm yeah, still not seeing mr samin unale here in the panel so i think it is better to uh, uh you have your observation first on all these issues and then if he comes then we will again uh, listen to him. yeah so what to you sir wait let me try i mean i will not try to answer all of them um Yeah, partly because I, I may not really be able to respond to them. Let me pick up one issue from uh, uh, Chetan uh, and a similar issue from Kala's uh, question and, and presentation. Uh, Chetan is asking me about UP. Now, rather than answering the question in the context of UP, there is a changeful. Issue involved here, which um, 
has often been mistyled. And the issue is that in India, a little over 80% of migration, overall migration, is within the state. It's the intrastate migration. And only about 20% is interstate migration. In fact, the figure, if I get it right, if I remember right, is about 86% is, is intra-urban migration. And all four kinds, that's rural to rural, rural to urban, urban to rural, and urban to urban. All four combined, 86% is intra, intra um, state. The larger question is that, you know, for urbanization to be really productive, we need mobility of the factors of production. The more mobile they are, and by factors of production, we go back to uh, typical capital, labor, technology, and knowledge-based land. Land being fixed in resource. Now in India, compared to many other countries, the intra-state mobility is much, much higher rather than interstate. So one of the things which is not moving while capital is moving is the labor part. And this has really got accentuated during the pandemic period. And here I bring in the UP. When the UP chief minister said that I'm going to send buses from UP to Kota, where over 300,000, three lakh students from UP were studying, and bring back, bring them back to my state and give them jobs here and give them training here so that they don't really have to go to another state. Now, this is the kind of a mental frame within which urbanization is taking place is, 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 is I would say this is this anti-growth uh, kind of an attitude. And I think this is, you know, earlier, even in, uh, uh, Dr. Chattopadhyay, would you give me a minute? Uh, the battery of this iPad is about to finish, and I need to change to another one. It will take only a minute. It will sure. take only a minute. Sure. Some sir, uh, Shamla ma'am is here. If you like to, Shamla ma'am, would you like to come in and ask your question? Uh, thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Arjun. Uh, Professor Mathur is already uh, 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 replying to the various questions, which I think uh, uh, Professor Chetan and uh, also Professor Kala have uh, put forth. Uh, I think uh, uh, also my questions have been read out. Uh, I think after he responds to some of those questions, uh, maybe I could uh, then uh, bring up these other questions, because mine is obviously environmental. And as you can see, uh, he's still addressing the issue of the definitions of urbanization and, uh, you know, population and uh, dynamics, which is happening in terms of governance, etc. So I'm willing to wait, if that's what you are saying. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think I'm back here. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, good. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I was raising uh, uh, Chetan's point here. Uh, this kind of originalism in the process of urbanization, which we witnessed during uh, during COVID, is a is a is a, is a very dangerous uh, kind of thing. Now we do know from literature, if we go back to sixties, Zakaria and and the Bog, I mean their work was that in India it is low on account of language on account of religion, 
on account of caste. But now, if we if we exclude, if we sort of more or less sort of exclude those factors, this kind of regionalism, you know, one is nationalism, we talked about a great deal, but even there's a regionalism in, in the process of urbanization, which I think is, is an anti-growth kind of a trend. And we need to we need to uh, stop this. Just for the, the, the linked point was uh, uh, the class point where, where she showed that particular graph on population density uh, and specifically referring to densities in places such as Bihar and the Pradesh and South of Kala, my reading of that, that graph was the densities are high not because of this, but because land is just not entering into the urban frame. And therefore, the densities are so high, no, which is completely different from the land-based urbanization which China is known for, that much of the urbanization, much of a greater part of urbanization that is taken by China in the on account of land expropriation by local governments. In India, the land just does not enter into, uh, into, uh, into uh, the market. And that is the reason that densities are high and also impacting the whole land market being so distorted these are some of the instances that really um, show that one. The second point that, that I wanted to take from there. Um, I quite agree with, uh, with, uh, with Kala that we need to begin to look at new fresh data, uh, in particular the night light data uh, for measuring urbanization, for measuring GDP. The issue that comes to my mind is these are, you know, if these are one time affair, then it is of no value at all. So either we are instituting these different technologies to do that on a regular basis in order to know whether, whether GDP per square kilometer is increasing or not increasing. But if it is a one-time measure, it doesn't add any value to it. I mean, there are plenty of night, the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, you know, the fast generating uh, uh, indicators that are, that are currently being used in different ways by the government of India. But those are really one-time indicators, one-time measures. And those one-time measures really don't help, particularly the researchers, they may help in announcing that how great we are, but they certainly don't help us very much. Um, the color I have not dealt with uh, issues of slums and poverty and transport, either in my report or or uh, uh, in my in my discussions, uh, but surely, you know, the, you know, we don't have after 2011-12, we do not have either the slum data or the poverty data. And I, would, my personal advice to all of us would be not to use the Niti Aayog's report on sustainable development goals, which does give some data on slums without giving the source of data. The new paper that has come from the IMF by Surjit Bhalla, you know, which has made news uh, saying that in India, there is no poverty at 1.9 US dollar per capita per day. Uh, uh, that's the paper written jointly by uh, Surjit Bhalla and, uh, um, and Arvind uh, uh, our friend and one of one of their associates, they and they have projected. They have made projections using the consumption expenditure of the period 2004-5 to 2011-12, and projecting the consumption expenditure, and then coming to the conclusion that India has no or 0.8 percent poverty. Now, I would not like to use such sort of projections, particularly in respect to poverty or, or slums, we really need hard data which can be compared over time. That would be, that would be my preference. Um, Kala, you are quite right that I have also not dealt with in our studies uh, the status of the town planning legislations uh, or uh, of the effects of digitization or urbanization 
partly because we don't know enough about it. We don't know enough about the, about the impact of this on the size of cities or on productivity. The one or two reports which have come in, uh, studies done by Ed Glazer, which are very interesting, and he has looked at Manhattan in New York, where there was a lot of out-migration of business and out-migration of, of, uh, of house, uh, households to smaller cities because of the work from home kind of facility available to them. And the rents in Manhattan have actually declined. Uh, which is not only what uh, Ad Glazer has said, but my granddaughter, who is at Fordham School of Law, she could get an apartment in Manhattan area for two thousand dollars <laughs> per month, which was which was certainly not possible uh, before the pandemic. So those kinds of impacts we see. Uh, the last, I completely agree with. Um, uh, the, uh, the the points uh, which were being made by our, uh, the uh, our speakers, I think um, the, uh, the uh, point was post pandemic and environment for me. Uh, I think I missed out those points in from my notes, um, uh, but we we. Um, Dr. Samyadeep, may I just quickly respond to just one point that Professor Mathur responded? Uh, yes, please, please, please. please. Yeah. yeah, actually, Professor Mathur, the GHSL contains data over time on nightlights, population, built area, and uh, GDP. So it Wait. contains data from 1975, 1990. 2000 and 2015. As of now, it stops at 2015, but I think the very high chances that they will continue this oh, for, really for all the then, about four. Then I'm all for it. Yeah, then, yeah. So then, the, I think they'll continue this effort. And this is I'm, not just for cities in India, all over the world, using grid level data at the subsidy level. So this is really very, very valuable. Which is which is very good, certainly. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm surprised that it is not coming to usage. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. In the, in, but, the uh, in the yeah. government uh, functioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Using uh, that data, I mean, if it is comparable over time, no reason why we should not be using that. Yeah, uh, and that is one, that is one non-local source of information. And we also have some local sources of information where we have information on the district domestic products. They are at the district level, but uh, we can take the non-agricultural part of the uh, GDP and then just assume that is the urban part. That but is another that, assumption we can so, that, well, that has also been after 2014 15. Yes, so, yes, yes, I know that. Yeah. And has also been suspended. Yeah, yeah. And also so, states like Gujarat, yeah. Punjab, and all, they are not part of this. Yeah, they are not part of it. Gujarat yeah, is, not, it is. That is not a part of it. Now, yeah. that is saying that the comparable data is like NSS 2017 18, which got leaked out. When, you know, it's not right to use the, the big data. The suspension of historical data is killing us in seeing what the trend is and where are we heading to. It's killing. But your 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 you know, even on the night light data, if you read another paper, which is combining the night light data with the ground level data and coming with the conclusion, which you will find in my in our report as well that it's about 34, 35%. Combining the night light data with the ground level data also places 2011 uh, uh, percentage of urban at about 34, 35 by combining. But of course, if you take only the night light data, then it gives a very, very different, very, very different picture. And also showing that Delhi to Lahore is the most urbanized part in South Asia, in South Asia. So we, we, we get these different, obviously you change the definition and you get the different results. Um, and the 2016-17 economic survey basically says that the Arvind Subramanian. Uh, I get this, uh, the point that, that was being raised about the rural urban shift, whether it is an accounting problem or whether it is actually so. My, my guess is, that this is an accounting issue. I would also, my, my hunch is that 
it is highly unlikely that manufacturing is moving towards the rural areas, excepting those which are land-based industry, uh, like paper industry, like sugar industry. I mean, they are, they are really rural-based industry. But I would, I would hesitate to say or conclude from the data that, official data that has come on the GDP composition and also the workforce composition uh, that manufacturing has actually moved out from the urban to the rural. And I would agree that it is, it, it is not deindustrialization trend that we are noticing at this point in time in the, in the country. Uh, the second point, uh, I also noticed that with was on work from home, digitization. I think these are all very, very new and uh, I mean, you can express your opinion at Dr. Chatterjee's point, uh, that we can express your, your, your hunch. But apart from at, at Kaiser, whose poor three papers have come into the market, we have really not seen any hard data on the effect of uh, COVID-19, uh, not necessarily of digitization, but COVID-19 on population movements and Ed Glazer has recorded that one. I can definitely forward the reference to Dr. Chatterjee uh, in a day or so. I have that uh, reference with me. And there are a number of other points um, which have been raised and I, um, uh, you know, including the uh, point, um, uh, the NCU part, uh, the urban management versus framework versus the urban development framework, the regional development authority, their performance. I think we need one more, uh, one more webinar where we can discuss uh, some of these, some of these issues. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, I feel somewhat inadequate to be discussing that as these have not been a part of my main work. And I, I have very peripheral information on some of these, some of these aspects. But I would, I would encourage our younger colleagues to uh, definitely take this up. I'm, I'm sure that this webinar is only the first one. And um, if, if we can encourage our younger population, uh, students and, and researchers uh, to pick on some of these questions, I think I would consider my evening to be very well rewarded. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mathur. And uh, just uh, before uh, just a, a formally ending this thing, so with your permission, uh, Professor, Dr. Mani was supposed to raise some, some of the questions. So uh, can we take some two or sure. more questions, two, three sure. questions from Dr. Shamanam? Okay. okay. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. So good to see you. And I'm, I'm sure you're keeping good health. Uh, yeah, it's really wonderful uh, listening to you uh, for such a long time. Uh, my uh, questions, uh, Professor Mata, was uh, basically on the environmental aspects like, uh, you know, the productivity uh, has uh, clearly been shown to decrease because of uh, Pollution, you know, I mean, there's adequate data now that we are following from the Public Health Foundation of India also that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pollution is having quite a big impact on, uh, on uh, the health and also the productivity of uh, persons in the urban area. In fact, uh, many of our urban areas have become almost synonymous with uh, pollution. So that is one aspect I think uh, we could look at because in case, uh, you know, we want, um, you know, uh, census towns which are uh, becoming urban on their own, what are the ways in which uh, we can, um, you know, help them uh, be free of uh, pollution because otherwise how else uh, can they um, also contribute to GDP? And uh, also I, I was putting an emphasis on the education and the skill development. Uh, especially in uh, census towns. I totally agree that, you know, when we are also doing this observation and all that, we notice that um, many of the census towns are organically just changing their nature and trying to become urban. But uh, they seem to be lacking the educational infrastructure and uh, also uh, any access to skills and uh, credit so that, uh, you know, just like 
changing the definition and uh, you know making them urban uh, will they really uh, contribute to gdp and also climate change as you can see very well is playing a very big role i mean just see what has happened to northeast or some of the other places in fact uh, today there is an article in the guardian which says that uh, in the urban heat island and um, uh, the heat all over in fact in all parts of the world and of course including uh, india has uh, also reduced uh, productivity to a great extent both in the formal and the informal sector uh, so these are some of, and of course urban flooding as you know has been creating havoc in many of our uh, cities and uh, that is also contributing to uh, reduction in uh, product uh, productivity so i was just saying that you know shouldn't we also bring in some of these factors and uh, you know and talk about how to create this, that resilience uh, when we say that you know we want to keep up the productivity or, or the gdp uh, contribution of urban areas that was like my question i think i think you are absolutely right i couldn't agree with you more uh, just for a second uh, i can you hear me yes we can hear you yes sir. yes sir. Uh, i couldn't agree with you uh, couldn't agree with you more uh, malaya um uh, see the all these factors whatever reports we see right come in not from not from within the country but the recently the pollution index that came saying that delhi is the most polluted city in the country um in the world sorry in the world and india is the second most polluted country in the world these kinds of data keep coming in and we keep reading them without doing anything about it now the only action that i have seen being taken on pollution is once again from the 15 finance commission report which has identified 44 metropolitan areas and saying that the grant that would be given to them is conditional upon their their signing an agreement with the ministry of environment that in the five year period the following things will be done to address the pollution problem now whether pollution problem is actually addressed or not we don't know what are the factors that really contribute to pollution whether they are manageable through these kinds of conditionalities conditional grants being given or being recommended by the finance commission or whether they would require a different kind of a treatment altogether uh, you know as as with, with my background of economics we were hardly ever exposed to environmental considerations it is only now that we have begun to look at them as part of economics uh, earlier it was not even a subject anywhere close to that uh, in in but i i think the points the two points that uh, that my life is raising both of them are very very critical how do we prevent census town from becoming get other places from where pollution becomes a huge planning and pollution becomes a huge huge issue fun and secondly whether we can build in pollution and pollution and productivity impacts as part of our policy to be to be especially dealt with uh, since climate since india is now uh, committed to direction to 1.5 degrees <laughs> by the year to be prepared we have not really agreed up to 2050 but possibly by the year 2060 or 70 india might be able to reduce those those temperatures but temperature apart what we have seen in north india this time the delhi temperature going up to 47 uh just early this month and late last month and in northeast it is raining it is heavy the heat island delhi which was which was completely uh, you know the highest temperature that we uh, have faced as far as delhi is concerned so i i completely agree with mahalaya that they need to be built into both our discussions discourses and somehow taken to this new committee that's now been constituted for dealing with urban issues uh, so again thank you anything uh, any other question i would be very happy to take that's perfectly fine 
So, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Mathur. I'm just seeing uh, Professor Mohalaya Chatterjee uh, in this panel. So, uh, if you uh, want to come down, please, you can unmute and uh, have your observations. So, uh, Professor Mohalaya, ma'am. Uh, no, I don't have to okay. ask okay. anything. That is, a, it's a learning experience for me once again. True. I just wanted to add that uh, we have to think about settlement planning. What Professor Mani had said, I agree to that, that, uh, that the pollution and others, if, you, if we, we let uh, uncontrolled urbanization go down like this, and census towns changing their land oh. use pattern and everything so first, uh, we need to go for more stricter settlement planning going beyond rural urban dichotomy and others. That was, that was uh, the point I wanted to make. Yes, yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. The way we, I mean, there are virtually no words to explain the way we are organizing. And the comment that was made by the member of parliament that our cities are in the ICU, if not on ventilator, I think that really represents a common man's view, the way urbanization is taking place in India. Uh, we have seen how Delhi has grown. I mean, I belong to Delhi. I was born here, and I have seen how beautiful the place used to be at at one time. A bicycle around and playing on on the India Gate and so on and so forth, and all that has disappeared from my memory. And when I talk to my children and grandchildren, they say, "What are you talking about? The fairy tales and so on and so forth." So, <laughs> you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. I just wanted to add one point, uh, if I may. Uh, uh, I was just uh, reacting, uh, listening to Dr. Mahalaya Chatterjee and also Dr. Shamala Mani on uh, their pollution and the environment. I really think Indian cities ha should have much more public transport because, I mean, I just returned from Los Angeles and actually two months ago, I left on March 30th and uh, 31st. And actually uh, our city, I mean, Bangalore seemed to be a lot more quieter. And now I've uh, returned first week of June and it seems like all hell is let loose on the roads of Bangalore. I mean, we have too many vehicles. And I think it seems like we are going to hit the one crore mark for vehicular ownership in the city. And I think this is a major, I, I think this is where we need more data on where Car carbon emissions are originating from by sector. And I think the transport sector is a very big contributor to this. And uh, I think the uh, a way to go is just either more work from home or definitely more electric vehicles and certainly much more public transport because our work on the state of our cities in Karnataka has basically shown that only large cities have adequate public transport. Small cities don't, uh, oh. medium cities don't have uh, that much of public transport. But I think all cities should go for much more, I mean, uh, uh, para transport, uh, public transport and end to end uh, mile connectivity. Uh, I think that's a really very big problem in our cities. And Los Angeles, I mean, it's known to be one of the most polluted cities in the world, but I was amazed to see how much of public transport is there in that country, end to end. I mean, I, I didn't uh, own a car. We didn't own a car when we were there this year and even last year. And we were able to extensively manage just with public transport, which connects to various parts of the city. That's really excellent. Metro, public transport, and you have paratransport. I mean, the, I mean, I think we have a lot to learn from uh, cities like those. Uh, I mean, that is not like a typical American city at all, but I was really amazed. And I think Asian cities, European cities have a lot more lessons to teach Indian cities there, I think. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thank you. And finally, uh, we have with us uh, uh, Mr. Samir Unahale. So uh, may I now request uh, Unahale ji, uh, if you can please uh, share your uh, views. And I request to the session, the session has already been, uh, it's too long. So if you uh, to, uh, please, Make some quick uh, maybe on five minutes. Yes, I'm absolutely. To... Uh, absolutely, it's always a great delight to be a part of any deliberations of Impri, and I think it's also a great honor to share screen with uh, Dr. Mathur, who is himself a legend in urban uh, issues and urban economics. So thank you very much for this opportunity. 
I think uh, I'm sorry I was a bit late to join and due to some technical issues. But uh, the topic was so interesting and whatever I could hear from Facebook and other uh, so other social media platform that I was listening, the impact, the, the significance of India's urbanization, I think, is too big beyond the beyond what we are perceiving the urbanization as. It's very important. Uh, any global challenge will have to factor Indian cities and the way Indian urban system responses to these challenges. I think uh, we have a lot to learn, and uh, despite all the efforts that we are doing, I think uh, the same mindset that we used 30 or 40 years back, I think is not going to be sufficient. And I always shared that the primacy of the municipal system as an institution to solve and resolve the urban challenges, I think is uh, seeing some uh, limitations. And uh, therefore, we will have to uh, cater to various new institutions, various new approaches of uh, trying to resolve the challenges we will be facing. I think during the deliberations, many challenges have been pointed out. Uh, mobility, yes, uh, pollution, water supply, sanitation, inclusion, technology. I think the list is endless. But uh, one of the things that can be tried for you know, making the India's urban system efficient and uh, stand up to the challenges, I think we need to try A is technology, B is citizen participation, and three is more and more collaborations. I hope that these three approaches, when applied to any sector, any challenge, should make the Indian system more probable to cater and you know surmount the challenges that uh, we have, uh, we will have to face. I think the challenges are increasing day by day, and whichever sector or whichever challenge that we will have to think of, I think technology, citizen engagement, and collaboration could be a new way of uh, addressing them and trying to uh, overcome those challenges. So I think that was point one I wanted to share. And secondly, uh, the issues of you know what's happening is that the Indian the, the institutions that are working in uh, India's urban system like municipality, like smart city, like level development authority, like metro rail, like the city transport organizations. All these institutions are uh, still, you know, falling short, and they are trying to solve the entire problem only on their own uh, capacity. I think that's one of the reasons why we are not seeing the coherence and the resonance, and you know, the ability to work together. I think that has been a major challenge, and therefore, if an individual institution tries to engage with all the levels of city problems, it's obviously going to fall short. And I think that's a major challenge that uh, we need to overcome. And uh, as we had uh, suggested earlier, that you know the smart city framework of getting all the institutions onboarding all of them by use of technology or otherwise into the board of directors, into the other operational uh, uh, collaborative frameworks that can come up is also very important. And I think we require, thirdly, I feel, and finally, <laughs> I will stop it here, it's already late, that we need to have a very, very different approach than what we are using right now. I fear, I'm scared that we are continuing with the own, uh, own same similar approach and therefore we might fall short of you know, overcoming them. A lot of uh, out-of-box thinking will be required, a lot of innovation will be required and any challenge that you can think of India's urban the institutions will have to come up with something different way of handling it. And what those way could be, how to implement that, I think is the challenges and the uh, the way that we will have to forward that. I think we can pick up a particular challenge like urban mobility. You can pick up it like water supply, like inclusion, like pollution, like health, like inclusion, like any, any, any challenges. I think uh, these institutions will have to work together and... Uh, come up uh, with a very innovative challenge. I'm sorry I was a bit broad into what I said, but uh, the way I was having I mean, other issues like traveling and network and technical challenges uh, did deprive me from being a part of it. So, uh, Samizit sir, so th thanks a lot. Sorry for being very cryptic and very late. I apologize for that, but I think it was great to listen and it was a very beautiful uh, uh, discussions uh, of all the honorable members that we had in this panel. So thank you, Samajit, sir. And if at all there is some time, I will 
uh, respond if you if if you allow me on that. Thank so you, thank sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sarvej ji, and it's over to uh, Professor Mathur for your final words. Yeah. No, just thank you for <clears throat> thank you every. Thanks a lot uh, to Impre to begin with, you, Dr. Shatopadhyay, Dr. Arjun Kumar, all my colleagues, uh, panelists, and all the audience. I'm really grateful that all of you could make it. Uh, I appreciate your participation and all the comments that you made were extremely valid and extremely timely. Thank you all very much. I think our discussion of this kind ought to continue. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mathur. And I hope uh, we will have you in our future MP conversation, MP series conversation as well. Like on a personal note, I started my PhD on this urban decentralization issue after reading your monograph uh, first time. That's on state municipal fiscal financial relation uh, published by a at NIPFT. So I first read and then I decided to do some of my PhD work on urban decentralization. So it's a great honor and privilege for me to listen to you. And so it's, it's really, it's really enlightening for me. Also, I uh, have received some of the uh, other research areas which we can work on uh, in the recent future. So there are many new areas, new insights which you have provided. So it's really wonderful to listen to you. So thank you once again uh, to you, sir, uh, to Professor uh, Kala S. Sridhar, to Professor Chetan Baidya, to Samir Unaraji, sir and all the other esteemed uh, uh, panelists, guests who have attended uh, today's uh, this web series uh, uh, talk on City Conversation Series. Now, may I now request uh, Arjun Kumar or, uh, or Impri to formally propose uh, the vote of thanks. It's, uh... Thank you. Thank you, sir. So to give the common vote of thanks, uh, Zubia, please go. As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Zubia, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. We like to express our gratitude to the speaker for today's session, Professor Om Prakash Mathur, for taking out his precious time to share his views on this crucial topic, the state of India's urbanization through his distinguished lecture. We thank our esteemed discussants, Professor Kala Sitharaman Sridhar, Professor Chetan Vedya, Samir Unhale, for adding their diverse perspectives and valuable insights to the deliberation. We are also grateful to some Dr. Somadhi Chattopadhyay for moderating and leading the lecture. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts. I hope that you continue to tune in future to our City Conversation Series and IMPRI hashtag Web Policy Talk. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening.